Dune Part 2, or How Paul Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Spice, is in theaters now, and it is what the critics are calling good. Denis Villeneuve's sci-fi epic is currently among the highest rated films of all time on several platforms, with moviegoers around the world saying things like, wow, cool. And Timothy Chalamet was a bad guy? I love the movie. I've already seen it twice. I will probably see it at least once more by the time this video ultimately comes out. It is simply astonishing. The performances, the spectacle, the sheer directorial muscle on display from Villeneuve. It is simply the type of movie that Hollywood does not make anymore. And I'm just ecstatic that it exists. <laughs> I'm in Dune mode. <laughs> In fact, I loved this movie so much that after getting out of my initial screening, I also drank worm pee, but instead of gaining prescience, I got sepsis. And when I got home from the hospital, I started to critically assess my thoughts on this movie to digest the near three hour artistic masterwork that I had just had the privilege of watching. And while I wouldn't necessarily call them gripes, I couldn't help but notice the several significant changes between this movie and Frank Herbert's Dune novel. Much like this new film, I think that the 1965 novel that it's adapted from is a masterpiece, a seminal piece of science fiction, nay, genre literature that's innumerable themes are as pertinent today as they were at the time of its publication. I try to reread this book at least once per year. I think it is damn near perfect. I cherish it. I even own it. It truly is my favorite book of all time, so you can imagine my shock and terror while I was watching this movie and I didn't see Count Fen Ring. Yucks aside, there are several adaptational changes in this movie that, while initially grating for a book enjoyer, are more cinematic in nature, more palatable to general audiences, and in my opinion are entirely justified within the narrative that unfolds on screen. And while I'm not going to talk about every adaptational change made, I'm sure there are already several YouTube videos out doing exactly that, I am going to talk about what I feel is the biggest change between movie and book, a change that alters the entire aura of a character and is essential to the movie's consistent brooding tone. And it also raises several significant questions about the future of Villeneuve's Dune series. This change, of course, is the omission of Count Fenring. No, no, no. It is the decision to portray Lady Jessica as an unequivocal antagonist. Lady Jessica is one of my favorite characters in Herbert's original novel, but not my favorite. We'll get to them soon. And while some interpretations could certainly perceive her as antagonistic, I don't think that any Dune reader would go as far as to say that she is an unabashed villain. She's nearly as important to the original Dune novel as Paul himself, her presence being paramount to not only the progression, but establishment of several of the book's plot threads. It's through Lady Jessica that we learn about the Bene Gesserit, the Quisetz Haderach, the prophecy that ultimately becomes what Dune is about. She aids in the manifestation of said prophecy and is with Paul every step of the way as he transforms from young ducal heir to Fremen leader. Dune, as we know it, really does not exist without Lady Jessica. And while the morality of the character is certainly gray, as it is with damn near every character in the novel, she's not really portrayed as antagonistic. She certainly encourages Paul and leads him down the path toward becoming the Quisatz Hatterack and thus inherently does manipulate the Fremen to her whims, but by the end of the novel she comes to feel remorse for her actions. She understands the weight of what she's done, and for proof of this I'm going to read a couple of lines from the final pages of the original book. Through it all threaded the realization that her son was the Quisatz Hatterack, and the fact gave her no peace. She saw his fatigue and how he hid it, but found no compassion for him. It was as though she had been rendered incapable of any emotion for her son. And then there's this subtle line right near the end that beautifully encapsulates her entire arc. Jessica nodded, feeling suddenly old and tired. Now, I'm not saying that a character coming to regret their actions renders them incapable of being an antagonist, but what I am saying is that Jessica is never presented as an antagonist. You understand why she's doing what she's doing. Every choice she makes is to assure the survival of her and her son. Yes, her actions do lead to the deaths of billions of people, but she's not presented as a traditional antagonist a la Baron Vladimir Harkonnen or Emperor Shaddam IV. And that's kind of the brilliance of Herbert's writing. I'm standing here talking about a person who manipulates an entire population for her own survival and personal gain and whose actions unintentionally lead directly to galactic genocide 
and I'm arguing that she's not an antagonist. But she's really not. She is the caring, loving mother of our main character. I'm not going to call him a protagonist. You grow attached to her early and understand why she does the things she does, despite many of her actions being retrospectively deplorable. You could ask any person who has read the original Dune novel, is Jessica an antagonist? And while a few, a few may say yes, I guarantee you they would pause before they'd answer. You'd get like a... Yes? And how you compare this character's nuanced depiction in the book to how she's presented in Dune Part 2... Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Jessica is presented as an objective villain in Dune Part 2, an antagonist more important to the plot than the Baron, Emperor, or even Fade Rautha Harkonnen. She arguably plays a more important role in the manifestation of the prophecy than Paul himself, spreading word of it when he's not around, continuously goading him into going down the path despite his best efforts. Hell, in this movie, she even tells him to drink the water of life and manipulates a Fremen into allowing him to do so. And I don't think the choice to present Jessica as an unabashed villain is a bad one. No, I actually think it's extremely beneficial in further driving home the primary theme of the novel, and I think the major reason why it works as well as it does is the sheer talent of those involved in this movie's production. Rebecca Ferguson is haunting as Lady Jessica. She delivers my favorite performance by far in the movie, even more so than Austin Butler, who himself is spectacular as Fade Rotha. She is simply stellar, from the command and vigor and persuasion with which she speaks, to her occasional physicality, to the micro facial expressions that she gives she is simply the most memorable part of this movie and part of the reason why this switch works as well as it does it is just a master class in performance from ferguson just as villeneuve is putting on a master class in directing he is flexing his directorial muscle all over this movie a great example of that being the visual story that he tells with lady jessica he subconsciously leads the audience down the path of hating jessica and feeling genuine disgust for her through the visual story he tells and that visual story is her physical transformation throughout the film whereas Paul truly immerses himself in the Fremen way of life and believes in them as a people as a population Jessica kind of views them as a vulnerable population that she can easily manipulate no longer able to raid with the Fremen due to her pregnancy she becomes their reverend mother slowly adopting the appearance of a traditional spiritual leader she adopts their attire and gets the facial tattoos superficially fitting in with those around her in an attempt to go garner trust. She takes on this appearance as she continues to spread word that Paul is the Lisan al-Gaib, legitimately singling out those who she deems vulnerable and manipulating them to further her agenda. She just sucks, and that's what makes her such a good villain, despite the fact that the character is presented differently in the film than she is in the book. And though the adaptational change is a relatively major one, I don't think it's one that necessarily misunderstands the source material. In both versions of Dune that we're talking about here, Herbert novel and Dune Part 2, the prophecy is presented as an antagonist. In the book, it's more so treated as this ever-looming intangible threat that's inevitable despite whatever preventive measures Paul takes. In Dune Part 2, Jessica is treated as a personification of the prophecy. And Villeneuve isn't really editorializing anything here. Basically, everything Jessica does in the film, she does in the novel. He just replaces endearingness with malice and thus presents her as a more traditional antagonistic figure. I think this line from Herbert's novel is beneficial in understanding why the character is perceived one way in one medium and another way in another. Paul sat silently in the darkness, a single stark thought dominating his awareness. My mother is my enemy. She does not know it, but she is. She is bringing the jihad. She bore me, she trained me, she is my enemy. Jessica's actions are nearly identical between the book and the movie, but in the book, she's presented as an unknowing participant in the prophecy. In the movie, she almost single-handedly ensures its manifestation. Notice I said almost single-handedly, which brings us to another significant change between the book and film. Aaliyah isn't born in this movie. That's not to say she's not in it. She does appear, just not in the traditional sense, say not in the way that a living character would normally appear in the 
the movie, despite the fact that she is very much alive. I understand why Villeneuve chose to present the character in this way, despite being my favorite character in not only Dune, but in all of literature, Aaliyah is admittedly weird. This is a novel that includes giant sandworms, bodily fluid recycling, and an addictive cinnamon flavored sand drug, and I think most people who have read it would tell you that Aaliyah is one of its more memorably strange aspects. She's a wisdom spewing, knife wielding toddler who just freaks everybody out and is a really bad vibe despite being really chill. Believe me, I would have loved to see her scurry around and stab Baron Harkonnen in the neck, but admittedly that really wouldn't have fit, especially not in the visceral world that Villeneuve established in Dune Part 1. For those of you who haven't seen Dune Part 2, which how you made it this far in a video in which I am talking almost exclusively about Dune Part 2, I have no idea, but alas, Aaliyah gains consciousness and cognition in the womb after Lady Jessica takes the water of life, much like she does in the original novel. But that's where the similarities end, however, as Aaliyah herself is never actually born. You briefly see her as an embryo in an oppression scene, but largely you only hear her. She is in constant communication with her mother after gaining consciousness. She expresses belief in Paul as the Quisa Tatarak and helps her mother ensure the manifestation of the prophecy, almost possessing her and helping her manipulate the Fremen around them. And those who read on in the Dune series will pick up on a key word that I said there, possessing. Aaliyah in the books is what's known as abomination, a preborn, somebody who gains the memories of her ancestors before her while still in the womb. And given their age, people who experience this fetal awakening often have difficulty fending off the stronger egos within their psyche when they're born. Those who do succumb to a possession to one of them are what's known as abomination. Aaliyah ultimately experiences this in the third Dune novel, Children of Dune, when she is possessed by Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. Now, I don't expect that particular scenario to ultimately play out in Villeneuve's Dune series. He's already stated that he wants to end his Dune association with an ultimate adaptation of Messiah, but I do think that this is his way of working the idea of Abomination into his take on the Dune universe. Aaliyah in this film is a form of Abomination, quote unquote, possessing her mother to help ensure the manifestation of the prophecy, as opposed to becoming possessed herself. And through her association with Jessica and direct role in her actions, Aaliyah too is presented as an antagonist, which is a complete departure from her depictions in the first Dune and Dune Messiah. And this brings me to, I guess, the larger point that I'm trying to make with this video. With where we leave off in Dune Part 2, we are set for a trilogy finale that, while set to remain true to Herbert's themes and messages, will likely be very different content-wise from Dune Messiah, the book. I expect the big moments to be there, of course, but just with what happened in Dune Part 2, it really wouldn't make sense for a direct adaptation, which Villeneuve hasn't done yet. But there are several changes in Dune Part 2 from the source material the treatment of Jessica being one of them, that kind of sets up for a very, very different Dune Messiah. They're putting together the same puzzle, just with different pieces. As Dune Part 2 comes to an end, the Jihad... <laughs> Holy War is about to begin, with Jessica and Aaliyah remaining as two of our more significant antagonistic figures. We're very much led to believe that their story is not over, and when we do ultimately pick up, they will be heavily present as antagonists. This is a complete departure from Dune Messiah. In the book, Aaliyah is a child, and to the best of my recollection, isn't presented as antagonistic in the slightest. Lady Jessica is not in the book. And this makes me curious, given the fact that Villeneuve has already stated that he plans to cap off this trilogy with an adaptation of Messiah, does he plan to incorporate at least some elements of Children of Dune to bolster the story and give Aaliyah and Jessica more significant roles? Dune Messiah is a relatively short book, as you can see. Herbert really only wrote it to really drive home the point of the initial novel after so many people thought that Paul winning was a good thing. And Children of Dune is much more strange than Dune Messiah. It's quite a bit longer as well. Uh, and... <laughs> It itself isn't really ripe for adaptation. There are a lot of strange moments that would be difficult to adapt to screen, but there are certain ideas and elements of it that could be folded into a Messiah adaptation to help, again, bring it to a three hour runtime and give Aaliyah and Jessica more things to do. I do not expect the Jessica Aaliyah dynamic to be lifted straight from Children of Dune. That really wouldn't make sense given what's been set up, but I do think there are certain elements that could be borrowed. For example, we now know that Anya Taylor-Joy will be portraying Aaliyah Atreides moving forward, which sets the character up to be more in line with her Children of Dune age, an adult, uh, than her Dune Messiah age. 
a child. I also think we may see the idea of abomination further built upon in the Dune Messiah adaptation, given how it's kind of weaved into Dune Part 2. And again, to the best of my memory, that idea isn't really explored fully until the Children of Dune novel when Aaliyah does become possessed by Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. And the Children of Dune novel can at least give Vilnius a blueprint for what to do with the Jessica character moving forward. In the book, she is in direct opposition to Aaliyah, which again is why I don't think the dynamic will be lifted straight from the book. But again, it's more of a blueprint given the fact that she again, is not in Dune Messiah. There's also quite a bit of imagery in Dune Part 2 that is very reminiscent of not only Dune Messiah, but Children of Dune as well. And that Villeneuve, given his propensity for and love for visual callbacks, I think it's very intentional and we will be seeing some of that repeated in his trilogy finale. But this is all just speculation that you may not agree with in the slightest. You might think it's all stupid, which is fine. I am quite stupid. But regardless of what Villeneuve ultimately does decide to do, I trust him 100%. He somehow made a better movie than Dune Part 1 and Dune Part 2. It genuinely may be one of my favorite movies of all time. I'm certainly going to go see Dune Part 2 in theaters at least a few more times. Times, and I cannot wait to see what he cooks up in the future with his sequel. A sequel that needs to include Count Fenring.